Okay, it's working now? Ah, perfect. Uh, and I think uh, the next talk uh, will be by Xavier, who will talk more about how we can uh, redesign DNA to cure diseases. So, myself, I'm a physicist, and I'll tell you a little bit how I got excited about genomics. And uh, basically, I have a pretty unorthodox way of thinking about genomics and how uh, the DNA material is very rich in any sample. So the first thing is, I like to think of DNA as trees. Uh, so here you have a, a tree there, a Christmas tree. It's, a, it's the right time to, to talk about Christmas trees. But if you imagine that the DNA molecule is a tree, then the content of DNA material in just one milliliter of blood is approximately the Amazon forest. So you have a huge amount of DNA in any blood sample. Actually, in any sample, it can be any liquid sample from sputum, from urine, uh, any biological sample has a huge amount of DNA. And the, the, uh, the forest analogy is not just correct in terms of, uh, of amount of DNA, it's also correct in the uh, way it's complex, in the diversity of the DNA it contents. Uh, so I really like to think about DNA in terms of this uh, Amazon forest. So if you take a blood sample like the one I'm showing right now, basically you have a lot of normal DNA uh, the DNA I'm showing in blue. And why you have all this DNA, it's pretty simple. Any cell in your body, when it dies, it has to e expel all, all its contents and it expels it through blood, so the DNA it contents gets into the blood. So you have a lot of normal DNA, wild type DNA in blue, but what you also have is you have DNA that comes from any other organism that's in your body, so it could be a virus. Uh, in that case, it would be RNA. It could be a bacteria. It could be also cells that are actually have mutations, so cancer cells. And you have those amounts of DNA in, in traces, in very small amounts. But you have all this variety of, of DNA molecules that actually contain all of the patient's health status at any time. And so it's a really a, a great, great opportunity for scientists and physicians to use this DNA and try to invent the future of molecular diagnostics. But it's also a great complexity because you're facing basically the Amazon forest and you're trying to find uh, something that has meaning uh, and that's very interesting for, for the patient and it might not be easy to find. Uh, the idea of using DNA uh, in blood to do tests is not recent. I mean, it was the very basic uh, first DNA test where on DNA, uh, DNA from blood, but it was looking at the normal DNA. Uh, this is how you actually find uh, the identity of a killer on a crime scene. This may be also the way you actually detect uh, genetic disease in newborn. You take his blood and you sequence or you look at this wild type DNA. So this is an old idea. Then there were other genetic tests that uh, were able to detect large amounts of other types of DNA like bacterial DNA, viral uh, RNA. Those were the early on PCR tests uh, that are now 20 years old. But basically when you're sick, if you have uh, HIV for example, which I hope you don't have, but if you do, uh, and you're very sick, then you have a lot of uh, genetic material from, from uh, HIV in your body, so it's easy to detect. It's a mass of red DNA in this background of blue, and you'll be able to detect it with uh, simple technologies. But now, what we know from recent technologies uh, that have uh, been able to detect those traces of DNA is that the real uh, key information is in those traces of DNA that are very, very hard to catch. So the, the, the new uh, paradigm is, is to look at this forest and to try to find the tree of interest. So one tree in that forest that makes a lot of sense for the patient. And so for example, that tree could be tumor DNA. So if it's tumor DNA in your, your blood, if you have tumor DNA in your blood, it means that you have a cancer somewhere. And so I'll explain how we can use this tumor DNA right now to change the way we treat cancer and the way we, we help people improve their life uh, when they have cancer. So if you take a, a human being with cancer, so let's say lung cancer, he has a big lump of cancer in his lung. Then at the beginning when he's diagnosed, you look at his blood content and you'll find a lot of tumor DNA. That's what I'm showing in orange. So roughly it's a lot, but it's not a lot actually. It's below 5%, so it's still traces. Uh, and currently, when you're treating this patient, you will monitor currently regularly uh, by imaging how the, the, the tumor decreases in size. So if the drug is working, you will first see the tumor size going down then at some point, maybe the tumor size will be almost invisible, and it happens quite a lot, then there's a resistance that appears, and then the tumor starts growing again. And that's what you get with imaging, you see the size of the tumor growing again. But what people are finding is that if you look at this circulating tumor DNA, at the beginning it's a high level, when you treat the patient, you see the tumor DNA going down. That's logical because the tumor is getting smaller. Uh, and then 
when the tumor is almost not there, you have a, a plateau where nothing is really happening. But what's very interesting is that actually you can see the increase of tumor DNA much before uh, the increase of the actual tumor size. So you can start seeing this resistance of the tumor uh, even months before you see it on, on imaging. And so you can take action when the disease is very small and yet very treatable. And so this would be a very high impact uh, for cancer patients if we're able to implement those tests on, on circulating tumor DNA in a routine fashion. <coughs> Uh, and so there are, I think, really big opportunities, uh, market opportunities, uh, applications for those traces of DNA. I mean, there are cancer, I talked about it. But there's also uh, applications in non-invasive prenatal testing. So here, if you have a pregnant woman, then you have DNA from the, the newborn, or it's, it's not yet born, <laughs> from the baby in the, the mother's blood. But it's, again, very small traces. And if you're able to detect those traces of DNA, and you can pre see very early on if the, the, newborn, the baby has a genetic defect, for example. So that's one application. Second also big application would be graft monitoring. It's very similar to cancer. If you graft uh, an organ on someone else, well, it's different DNA. So we'll see DNA from that graft in the patient's blood. It's traces, but if you see that those traces starts increasing, it means that the graft is dying. And so you can uh, know that the graft is not taking and you have to take action and, and prevent the death from happening. So there are very big applications with those, uh, uh, by looking at those traces of DNA. And the reason we know there are applications is because there's an amazing technology that has appeared over the last 10 years. It's sequencing, uh, next generation sequencing from companies like Illumina, uh, Iron Torrent as well, which was, has been mentioned. And those sequencing technologies, they're amazing tools, research tools. They are able to detect, quantify, characterize DNA molecules in ways we couldn't even imagine 10 years ago. Um, the original way we tended to think about uh, genetic uh, analysis was PCR. So PCR is the original technology, but to detect DNA, you had to know what you were looking for. So this was pretty limited. Uh, if you knew the sequence you're looking for, you would do a PCR test and you would say, yes, no, it's in there. But you wouldn't be able to detect new things. And now with sequencing, you're reading the genome. So you don't have to know what you're looking for. You sequence your, your blood sample and you try to read and, and detect all the DNA molecules you have in there. So basically, we now have this big picture uh, that there are a lot of information. The issue if you want to implement those tests in routine is that sequencing is still a research tool. It's quite bulky, it's still expensive, and it's run in, in, in big labs. Um, and so we think that there's an alternative to this technology called digital PCR that's very useful if you want to detect those traces of DNA. I'll explain briefly how it works, and it's very simple. The idea is you take the blood sample, you extract the DNA, and you're going, going to want to look at this uh, orange mutant DNA of interest that's very rare. If you do that on the bulk sample, well, your mutant DNA is diluted uh, in a background of normal DNA, you will never be able to detect it. So what you do with digital PCR is you start by taking your sample and you split it into tens of thousands, even millions of subsamples. So you cut it up into pieces and you separate the DNA molecules in different compartments. And when you've done this uh, partitioning step, then you do your uh, genetic analysis. So you amplify the different compartments to uh, basically color the compartments depending on the genetic contents. And then you look at the colors of the, the, the partitions. If they're empty, they're, let's say, white. If they contain normal DNA, they're blue. If they contain tumor DNA, they're orange. And so then you can just count the different compartments and count individual molecules. So it's a very powerful technique that's able to uh, detect single molecule uh, uh, DNA and to quantify very precisely DNA. And so at Stila, what we're trying to do is we want to make this digital PCR technology a routine technology. So we've developed uh, what I, I like to call a piece of plastic, so I have one on me. So it's, a, it's really a piece of plastic. There's no active uh, technology in there. And as you will see, it has all the functionalities to do this digital PCR uh, uh, analysis. So the way it works is you take your plastic chip and you pipette your sample into the chip. So you take your DNA extract with some, uh, some chemicals and you pipette it in there. And then you seal the chip and then you're done to, to run the analysis. And so the first thing that you would do is you would place it in a machine which will push the sample through. And as you push the sample through this uh, plastic chip, again, there is no active component, so it's very cheap, very easy to use. Uh, what happens is that you partition the samples into tens of thousands of, of micro droplets. So I have a small movie showing how it works. If it works, yeah. Uh, so as the sample flows into this chip, 
uh, you produce tens of thousands of small droplets. So the, the small round things that you see moving are micro droplets. So it's less than a nanoliter in volume. It's basically the size of the cross section of a hair, so very tiny. And we make tens of thousands of those on a single chip, just by flowing the sample through. Again, it's very easy to do. And then the next step is to, like I said, to amplify the DNA. So what you do is you heat and cool this plastic uh, chip with your droplet array inside, and you kick off this PCR reaction which will amplify the DNA in the different droplets and will color the droplets depending on their genetic contents. So this is uh, the, the chemical reaction. And at the end, you take a big picture of this 2D droplet array and you get a result that's something like that. You'll have droplets that are empty, they're in black here, Droplets which contain wild type DNA in green. Droplets will contain tumor DNA of a certain kind in blue. And then here what you see is a very, just one uh, a droplet that's red that uh, has a, a tumor DNA that's a resistance. So when you see this picture, basically you know that there is a, a, a mutation in the cancer that will not respond to treatment and you know there's a potential problem when you start treating that patient. So this is, a, just by looking at this picture, you can get a lot of information about those tiny uh, details that matter in a, in a biological sample, the trees that matter in your forest. And so at Stella, uh, we really want to make this, uh, this technology a routine technology to bring digital PCR and, uh, and, and uh, the future of, of molecular diagnostics to routine applications in hospitals. Uh, we're not there yet, exactly. We still have, we have a functioning technology, so those were the instruments that I was showing you, but I think we still have to integrate those technologies and have one tool that's very simple to use where you plug your device inside, it runs the analysis, it gives you your results. I think it's something that we can uh, reach in the next uh, three to five years or so, uh, but even if it's without or with, uh, with us or without us, uh, what you can be sure of is that in the next five to five, three to five years, you will see those, uh, those uh, diagnostics, genetic diagnostics tests becoming more and more available in, in the labs and it will really change the way we think, we think about diagnostics and, and healthcare. Uh, and with our technology, the goal I think is not, not just not to, to provide those tests for the rich uh, patients in the, in the rich countries. We want to make this widely available. So you have to find something that's very simple. And this is why we, we are betting on the, just a piece of plastic, so something that's uh, very cheap to produce and that we can spread uh, to uh, the most uh, uh, patients around the world. So thank you for your attention. Thank you.